My name is David Hawkins and this interview is for the Ming Ai Institute London. It's part of the British Chinese Workforce Heritage Project. And could we begin uh, by you telling me your name? My name is uh, uh, Ke Song Xuan. The surname is Ke K E, and Song S O N G is my first name. And uh, Dr. Ke, where were you born? I was born in the center of China. The province is called Hubei. Uh, can you uh, tell me about your uh, family? Uh, how many siblings did you have? Oh, I have a quite big family. At the moment, I have uh, uh, two other brothers, uh, two sisters. So I'm one of them. I'm the, I'm the middle one. Ah, okay. I see. And uh, what work uh, did your mother and father have? My parents both uh, worked in in the China in in the middle of China. Those time work as a uh, mainly as an engineer. My father was an, an engineer, and then my mother was just normal work in the manufacturing. Uh, which manufacturer? What she manufactured? Yeah, my 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 mother worked for a sort of a uh, like a medicine or, um, a sort of a pharmaceutical manufacturer. So it's more making some um, medicine, particularly like medi medical or medicine or plasters. So that's what the the manuf manufacturing making. And then my father was working for uh, the company equivalent here, like you know. Um, power company. And would you talk to your mother about the work that she was doing in the factory? Is that how you first became aware of medicine? medicine? Well, no. And um, the medicine, uh, the the reason I was get into medicine, or rather Chinese medicine, there is a, a sort of sort of a story about this. Is um, uh, my family traditionally. We had some in our history in the family. We have had some Chinese doctor in the family, which is in China is quite a traditional because a family running a family, a doctor in running families. So and uh, uh, when we get to my father generation, my father was sort of studied or worked as a you know as a scientist at engineering work. So did not go to the medicine this career. But when he was getting old, he was rather regret his life, you know, did not choose the right path. He was quite interested in medicine. So, in fact, my, my father uh, wished at uh, that time when, I was, when, when we were all small, was, uh, he said, we want one of my children or one of my children to become a doctor in the future. So, and, uh, and, and particularly, he's very fond of uh, Chinese medicine. So, so because of that reason, so he always persuade us to study medicine, and uh, and uh, even when I was very young, from age of thirteen, so he even found me about three masters equivalent. We call them medicine medicine the men, you know, it's like old masters. They are not they are not sort of professional doctors, but they are doctors in the old fashioned way, Chinese way. So I was uh, uh, sort of working uh, study for them for. For many years, from age of thirteen to age of seventeen, about three, four years, during the weekend. That time, I was still in the middle school, so I studied with them, to collecting herbs, to go to the mountain and lake district, because of my area, my part of China is a very mon mountain and the lake district. We have, a, we have a one thousand sort of uh, lakes in our province, and lots of lots of lakes. So water and the mountain is a is a common feature. So there's a lot of good plants. So. So I studied my medicine from very young age, even before I went to university. So that's how I get in medicine because my father wanted me to study Chinese medicine, and uh, of course I'm not. It's it turned up. I have more than one doctor. My other my other two brothers all doctors. My elder brother is a, he's a doctor working specialized in MR scanning. He used to working for the Harvard University teaching hospital for eight years. Now he's in another uh, hospital in 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 America. My young brother, also a doctor, also highly qualified doctor. He he works for the for uh, like DNA specialized and DNA site, and he works in Los Angeles, so as a doctor. So and I'm the only one in the family actually a Chinese doctor, and inherited all my Chinese my Chinese doctor tradition, and in fact I got all my family books from my 
father inherited from the generation above. So therefore, I have all these family books. Some of them is handwritten for about you know, a few hundred years. The, and one of my oldest books was about 800 years old books. It's for my family. So I got all of them. And are these books uh, anatomical or uh, what sort of information do they cover? Well, the Chinese medical books, obviously in, in those times, are mostly written by individual doctors. And uh, some of them may be published, some of them never published. So that's why those are handwritten. So there are many is about the individual experience treating illness, such as say, if somebody suffers from like say, you know, um, hepatitis or we call it jaundice at that time, maybe and uh, maybe some problem with infection, you know, maybe like chicken pox or these sort of things. I see lots of in, even in old books that the hand drawing like chicken pox, little you know, little pops, thing like that. So therefore, yeah, there's the various there's more more about about the the condition we're treating. Yeah, there are a few books about theory, but more, and uh, those are more printed book in old time, but this is more for handwritten books. So after your years during uh, middle school, training yeah. with these masters, uh, do you come over, did you come away with some qualification or uh, so sort of, uh, how did you, uh, yeah, did you receive any qualification? How did you progress then okay. in yeah, training with those masters? Yeah. Well, because uh, this is we have to go back to the uh, educational system or political system in China at those times. Uh, during, during those years, China was in the, especially when I was that small that age, we are right in the middle of a cultural revolution. Okay. So that in that in those period of time, so China has have this uh, have this policy, so all of the middle school graduates was from a city are sent to the country to so-called re-education, so regardless of what you are. So uh, nobody can go to university unless you've been re-educated, re-educated, sort of. A. So therefore, after middle school, I was sent, I was working in the, in, in the farm for, for two, more than two years, as a, that's like one of many millions of Chinese students working there. So uh, the, because the study was a master's, it didn't get any qualification, just only you learn. That's, that's, that's in fact this old fashioned Chinese way of training doctors and there's no such a degree in the old time. So I learned many uh, first hand knowledge, such as like say, I can recognize many, many plants and how to collect them and how to make them into medicine. So and for treating simple illness and uh, or sometimes maybe complicated illness. For example, the snake bite. You know, in in this in, in now that even the hospital has very fearful. If you have a very poisonous snake bite, body treatment, it's very difficult. So we know how to do it with medicine. And then after that, I went to this country so education, so called in, in the farm. But luckily, because my farm I specialized the way the the work I was doing, in fact, is growing Chinese herbs. So I go back to my old profession again so I studied how to collect the herbs so now I, I I know how to grow in herbs and how to make them sort of collect them and store them so and also during those two years I had another particularly very interesting job is because we are many many so-called sort of students working together in the farm so in those years China have a medical system it's called have a barefoot doctor so they're called barefoot doctor is because of those in those times, there's, there's not enough medical or university trained doctors in the country because of very few universities anyway. So majority of the people's sort of primary health is sort of looked after by a so-called barefoot doctor. Those doctors, on the one hand, they're working as a farmer. So that's why they wear the no, 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 no shoes, so-called barefoot. On the other hand, they also can treat many simple illness, such as say, you have a cut, you have some like diarrhea, of headaches or fever, so there there no basic, basic sort of a skill, training for a few months. So I was trained for a couple of months in the in the in the in the, in the hospital, like all the nursing injection of the work, and plus my previous training as a, for my masters. So I was quite good as a working also in the meantime as a barefoot doctor for two years in the farm. So that's gave, gave me more knowledge. So that's after that, and then I went to university to study medicine and uh, because at that time Chinese politics changed from from the 
from the time Cultural Revolution, they want to send all the people to go to university through the so through the workers, peasants, and soldiers, how according to how loyal the, to the government, change to from that year, from my year, change to how good academically. So therefore, we have a nationwide entrance exam. So I very luckily passed the exam. So I then can choose the university I want. So in fact, I choose the first one to study Chinese medicine, which I get it. And that's why I'm here. So were you, um, were you in a, or you an unusual student that you already had a good number of years in first-hand experience yeah. of treating patients compared indeed. to your classmates. Yeah, yeah, indeed. But this this is not very rare because in my year, which is very interesting, which is called which Chinese is called in 1977. So if you if you tell anybody about say the student in Chinese history from 1977, this is the first year after the Cultural Revolution, come back to the university by the examination. So it's a, because I have more than 10 years, university students never gained this examination all through different. So there's 10 years a gap. Chinese, Chinese sort of in academia have a big gap. Nobody come have a proper knowledge. So therefore, in my year, we have many people like me to working in a farm, in some way, some other peasant place, or even workers for, they have, they have a, some knowledge like me, you know, barefoot doctors, so come. So it's not rare. And uh, so therefore, yes, we have a, for compare with some people without this knowledge, have a lot of advantage. Perhaps that's, that's another reason why, as soon as I come to UK, I become much more, very easily, getting sort of into, the, into my profession in a very top, top of my profession. Because when I, when I was giving lectures to many schools, in fact, the first lecture I was giving in this country is in Oxford University. I was giving lecture in Christchurch College in Oxford. And uh, there's about 30 people, doctors uh, and the nurse, or people, or people come to my lecture to see what is Chinese medicine, how it works. So I give them, I give them the, the, the talk about Chinese medicine, how it works, how we use medicine in our native sort of way to use. And they're very fascinated because all they talk about is very, very sort of uh, things which we use in our, in our life, not even written in the book. So that's why many people start want to learn from me more. So in other words, I have a real, what, what do we call real authentic Chinese medicine, the knowledge, the skill and the experience. And going back to your uh, brothers and yourself yeah. all ending up in medicine, w was this something you were uh, very motivated to do? Yeah, in fact, I could say my family rather sort of a genetically speaking perhaps we are quite good in science that's why my father was studying engineering was good so in fact when i was in middle school i was very good at math and those are all my brothers too so in in my in my middle school we have a math competition and i was a champion i, I, I came on number one so i should go to scientific study math but i didn't because i followed my fa my father's wish there's always chinese tradition a son always follows the father's wish to do whatever he wants to do. So anyway, so and uh, but of course, my other brothers uh, do similar things, but more towards Western medicine. So I'm the one particularly interested in Chinese medicine. So and yes, and that's no no really regret. But we, you know, there's no no way we can compare. If if had I not done this, what would happen? But we are very happy, and uh, and particularly particularly the 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 older I get, the more work I'm get. And really more I think that this profession is good because particularly nowadays the most thing making me happy is I see so many thousands of my patients come to see me they feel wonderful they feel happy many 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 people for example can't have a children after you know tried many many times IVF or other treatment nothing works and come here after a few months they conceive naturally or somebody have I said problem with cancer doctor tell them gonna die and they come come to see here. Even, you know, sometimes they tell them you're going to die in a one year or two years time. But people come here after 10, 20 years still alive. So that's very pleased. I'm very pleased for that too. I can imagine. So when after your time in university in yeah. China, yeah, did you come away as Kaishen? Were you Doctor Ke already? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when 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 went university, so that is what called a proper qualification. Six years or in university study for that. 
So I was for well, five years studying another extra year, uh, extra study in university. So in total, six years I was there and uh, and qualified as a doctor. So at that time, so that means in China, I could practice in a, any hospital and prescribe medicine, both Western and Chinese medicine. And but because I, my background of my medical background knowledge is good, and also maybe I will study hard. So I was immediately kept in the same university to become a teacher. Because that's quite rare, because normally they want all the young young guys go, but it's a few good 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 students, they will, they will keep them and uh, further training and make them become teacher. So I was become teacher there. And that, because that's the very reason. So that's why I have chance to come to UK, because, because in my university, a, in the, the university I worked uh, as a teacher and a doctor there, and um, we are the one of the top universities in China, training Chinese medicine, and uh, uh, we have many foreign doctors and students come to study Chinese medicine in our university. So at that time, luckily, because I was one of a, uh, one of those sort of young doctors could speak English that time, so therefore I was able to communicate with lots of foreign students or foreign doctors. And even I do teach them and tutor, tutor them. So therefore I made lots of friends. So that's why eventually they helped me and uh, you know to, to, to get out of China and to study or to, 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 to come to UK. What was the name of the university you went to? It's called the Guangzhou University of Chinese Medicine. Yeah. Um, and bringing you right back to the present day now, yeah. uh, uh, what is your current main focus? What do you spend most of your time well, doing these days? Well, my work at the moment, uh, at the moment, as probably here in film here, this is a, this place is called our Santa Academy of Chinese Medicine. And uh, uh, this organization is I formed it, sort of uh, um, founded in in sort of uh, 1999, so nearly 15 years today. And uh, the major work for this we're doing is to teaching Chinese medicine for Middlesex University, and uh, we also uh, provide some um, acupuncture uh, clinical service for National Health Service, such as. And Royal Free Hospital, Whittington Hospital, and North Middlesex Hospital. And then, of course, thirdly, I also see many patients here. So the, my, my job is uh, now to do is teaching, seeing patients, and also uh, working for National Health Service. Um, and what reasons uh, do people give you for choosing traditional Chinese medicine? Is it uh, that they believe it's preventative or less harmful, or is it a, do they consider it a supplement to Western medicine? Well, obviously, there were for different people, different purpose. But people come to me, to be honest, most of them is because they have a problem, they can't solve it. They went to, there were many people come to me before, to, before they, 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 they came to me, they normally see numerous doctors and hospitals and uh, or even see other alternative, so-called alternative practitioners. So um, they find uh, most of them sort of uh, has a, not have a good response for the treatment. So in a way they come from, to, to me, it's kind of very much desperate situation. So I, mean, I see many, many uh, serious conditions, especially DHT. But of course now, since I'm working here, almost you know, 28 years, this year, they might very soon now, so and uh, uh, some people get a trust on me now. So therefore, sometimes yes, for the simple problem, but most of it is a complicated and serious condition to come to me, such as like say people have a cancer, diabetes, you know, or infertility, or serious pain, or serious depression, or these sort of things. So uh, perhaps in contrast to your experience in China, much more a sense of. Yeah, last resort. Or yeah, yeah. Been, the patient here is different from Chinese patient. I see. I saw in Chinese hospital. For example, in China, when I work in the hospital in my university teaching hospital, I in the morning I could see fifty patients. Every patient just two three minutes, just like your GPs, a couple of minutes ago, a couple of minutes ago, and prescribe something. So because some of the very simple condition, just cold or did a coughing or thing like that, but here's more complicated. People come to more more longer history, longer. So therefore. I could not do that. I could only do it maybe in the morning. 
when, when I was busy, very t- busy, I normally see about 30 to 40 patients a day. So therefore, maybe half day, 20 patients or 10 patients, something like that. And could you, uh, what, what, firstly, what's your role in, as part of uh, the Asante Academy, yeah. apart from being its founder? Yeah. Um, and within that role, how do you, um, where do you see the Academy in the future? Okay. Now, first of all, Let's also go back to about 1997. Uh, in 1997, Middlesex University started the first Chinese medicine degree course in this country. So, in fact, that course, the start, the reason the Middlesex would, uh, was able to start this course, which is very rare for British, a British university to start Chinese medicine degree course, because for Chinese medicine in the, in the old time, maybe perhaps still now, people are thinking, well, it's, there's no scientific-based medicine, so it's not evidence-based medicine, so therefore it is not medicine, so they call them. And it's like, you know, Chinese medicine should not be taught in the, in the university. So we we'll think, maybe even some people have a negative at- attitude towards Chinese medicine, it is a completely crack or something. But anyway, so through, just before those years, when I came to, you, to, to, to UK, I was successfully working, uh, kind of see many patients and have a good publicity. I was working for uh, many of the even newspapers, even BBC TV, ITV, all this come to film me. So I did lots of publicity and I give a lots and lots of lectures anywhere. So people, people eventually convinced and persuaded to think this is something good. So that's, that's how we initially start this Middlesex University degree course. So joined with Middlesex University, with University of Beijing, TCM University of Beijing, and, and, and uh, Asante. So we start this course together. So, and teaching Chinese medicine in university level. So as a part of the university, sort of whole sort of um, uh, training uh, program. So we need a place for a student training, clinical training. And, uh, and that's why I started this Asante Academy. So primarily, the Asante Academy is for Minnesota University students clinical training. And so I started these things and uh, I get everything planned, organized, find doctors and find and get all the things. So, and ever since we're doing very well, we trained many, many students up to now, 15 years. So I had a very good response. The students always in university highly sort of praise this is at the best part of, of the Chinese medicine degree course because they learn a lot and for that reason and also I try to expand to them to promote them into international health service because for me for personal work as a, as a doctor it's not too, too difficult because I have experience treating the, the patient but I don't think the one person is not good enough so I need more people to know Chinese medicine that's why I want to go to education. And also, if we don't get this thing recognized eventually by normal medicine, the doctors, we still never get anywhere. So therefore, that's why I will try to work hard to persuade the National Health Service, the doctor, to use this. So, so luckily, I didn't manage. So for the past 10 years, we've been seeing for many, at least more than 10,000 patients in the hospitals. And, uh, and the response of them always in favor so the asante academy is part of that uh, promotion and yeah. example of yeah. good traditional chinese medicine practice and how um, beneficial it can be yeah um ha- how is it just through the number of students that you have in the academy or how else do you use the academy to promote chinese medicine yeah because uh, you know, because in Chinese medicine, in this country or in any country, in any, in any other countries in the world, and uh, uh, although for the past say twenty years has become popular, but they always come good and bad images. Some part think Chinese medicine, you know, some clinic is com- completely very run down, low class, dirty, you know, and maybe even just charge too much money, not for work. All these things, image. Or some medicine, some clinic, you maybe even get some people have a little, you know, um, 
sort of a bad image, you know, for, for various reasons. So, and that's why I feel that is wrong because it's not properly introduced Chinese medicine to the West. Because Chinese medicine, I always tell many people, I said, Chinese medicine, they can survive in China for more than 5,000 years, even up to now. So, must be intrinsically something good inside. Otherwise, this is, we're not able to last like fashion. This is not fashion. So intrinsically, they are good in something. Just unfortunately, people did not have a proper knowledge to teach, to spread, or have a proper skill, say English. They had some Chinese of not good English to tell people. So that's why I want people in the West know Chinese medicine properly. So what is real Chinese medicine practice? We are not telling people we have a we can we can play miracles. We don't tell people we are like magicians. No. Everything people come to us, we tell them what is the problem. Some problem we can help, some problem we can't help. Some problem may take a longer time, some problem maybe a short time. So there's no such oh yeah, you take this, you bet tomorrow, or put one needle tomorrow. No, there's nothing like that. So but because of this we want to control this proper ethics of the practice. And of course, I want to teach people the real authentic Chinese medicine. Because there are many, many knowledge in our Chinese medicine. Even many books, we have a lot of them. The problem is because many books are written in ancient Chinese or in old Chinese. So even for many Chinese people, it's difficult to read them. And, uh, and many of the meaning in Chinese, the, the textbook, is between the words or between the lines. So those things, you need a very good doctor to, to, to explain to people. So therefore, that is what I'm trying to do. So give people the real, authentic, authentic knowledge and uh, guide them to practice, to learn properly. And of course, and by then I can show the public, I can show the medical authorities, here we are, there's something working, simple, safe, and uh, sort of reliable. Do you find that Western practitioners of medicine yep. have similar views of traditional Chinese medicine to the public, or is it, do you encounter different opinions from? Of course, very, very, doctors? very different. First of all, public, because the most public, although they know a little bit of medicine, but at least they are not medical trained, so they don't have a fixed concept of Chinese of, of what a medicine should be. So, for anywhere for for the public. I said to people before, you know, probably don't care if something ill, if something wrong, they don't care what to use as long as get it better. So just I to give a very simple and sort of sort of sort of so sort of, sort of examples. I say, if your car broken down on the street, so you don't care what is the AA come or what is a, a, a you know ISC or what is a black man or what is a white man come, doesn't matter as long as you make a car start again. That's all. That's all we matter for 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 driver. So same as a patient. So to, to us, if somebody have a skin condition, say very itching, dry, and not, not sports, you don't care whether you take a drug or you take a Chinese medicine, as long as you make your sports go away. That's all you need to do. So therefore, that's why for public, the opinion is more for result. Okay, you, you give me better, I trust you. Now for doctors, it's slightly different because they are more medical trained. They have this fixed way of thinking about medicine should be. So if we make something better, they say, well, you maybe just this get better spontaneous, spontaneously. Or they say it's a placebo effect. So therefore, it's nothing to do with you. So in the end, so in a medical profession, it's more difficult to convince them to prove this work because the reason is because they are trained mostly scientific way and changing medicine mostly are not scientifically sort of based in, in the old time. And how does technology tie into that as well when uh, you mentioned your brothers one of them uh, works with the MR yeah and yeah the other brother works with DNA, DNA yeah and so you uh, especially in America yeah they've got lots of money and they're on sort of cutting edge yeah absolutely how does that frame Chinese medicine then yeah this is this is another big big part of the things we need to develop in fact nowadays I'm trying to even work on this area try to Try to try to write some. I'm, I'm writing some books as well. I'm doing lots of talks. How can we merge with old Chinese medicine to modern science? 
because initially in China, for the many for the past say thirty forty years, the Chinese government to try to merge of Chinese medicine and Western medicine, most of them have failed. So, but now I wouldn't use the words just merge Chinese medicine and Western medicine. In end up, you just kick out Chinese medicine because you can't explain them the way Western medicine wants to explain. So therefore, it's like even acupuncture, say how you put needle, make people pain get better. So if you say needles not put in the nervous system, as we said, it's not. China, the needles are put into the meridians. So then the next question would, what, where, and the, what is meridians? Sir? They say, it's, you, we will say energy, it's a word energy flow. And they say, what is energy then? So it's end up we can't answer in a, in a so-called Western medicine way. But that doesn't matter. So what I want to do is to say, we want to merge them to what called modern science. What do you mean by modern science? Even the traditional science, science has changed. From, for example, you know, in 1800s or 1700s, the Newton theory of classical, you know, Newton law one, law two, and order three. So those are very good for many of the mechanical, much more sort of a theoretical, this kind of mechanical sort of, a, you know, the, 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 the force, the, the, the gravity, all these things. But when you look slightly in the big picture, so for example, those things, those theories, the Newton theory in the old time, is much, there's your thinking, all the force, everything moving, or everything, the inter it's just individual one-to-one -one inter interact. So that's why they got their, their, their all these laws comes. But but if you look at a much bigger scale in our universe, that's not such a one to one, it's one to many millions. So we're all relatively in a very complicated place. That's why the Einstein's theory comes replace Newton theory now. It's more relativities. So everything's come much more complicated. The space, the time can be twisted as well. So therefore what I want to feel, I want to say to Chinese medicine, this is another subject I want to, I want to do more future, is Chinese medicine, in fact, we are more, not simply can equivalent to the Western medicine, but we have a different way to look of the, of the, 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 the body, the, the, the everything, the balance, the, the, the energy and everything. So perhaps in a much, either much bigger scale, such as like a universal scale, or much, much smaller scale, like a quantum scale. So therefore, that is why, for my teaching to many people, when I explain, explain to them this way, in fact, scientifically, it makes sense. You know, when we talk about it, for example, early, early on, we talk about the Chinese, say, acupuncture based on the meridian, meridian based on the energy flow. So energy, what is energy? In fact, now, it's not simple to say energy, just energy as you all have here, energetic. Energy is a much complicated things, and one of them, which I explained to them, is, is like very much equal, equivalent modern science to said, it's like invisible power, which is now in the universe we call dark energy, dark matter, which is invisible, but it's there. Same in our body, we have something inside, maybe not visible yet, but it's there. So that's how we, I'm trying to do more explain and teach them that hopefully in time I mean because maybe need many many people to work many years so that's ten time we merge together so the Chinese medicine and the Western science and come with Western medicine too and then merge together oh yeah that's the that's part of human body because now it's like the Western medicine to look at the body with their telescope they can or microscope both they see only one scope thing but we need to see you can only see one, one side story, but our universe is multi-dimensional. So you can't just see from one dimension. Perhaps other dimension can see different things. So that's the Chinese medicine comes. So uh, staying on this uh, relationship between your work in Chinese medicine and specifically the NHS. Yeah. Uh, how many? How often are do you get referrals from Western practitioners? Yeah, in our NHS service clinics, which we run almost every day, all the hospitals, they're all referred by by, by Western doctors. We don't book patients. We have a we don't take care of booking. We only treating patients. So in fact, all referral organized by the GPs and consultants. 
Uh, well, I think actually <laughs> we've discussed uh, discussed this a bit already, but Bye. I think it was. Um, it's is that then seen when they're referred? Yeah. Is that then seen as the core treatment rather than a supplement? Normally, it's a core treatment. Yeah. Most of them, people are referred to us. Mm. They have gone big toll of other departments first. Mm. So they maybe go to the GP a few times, to go to the hospital and different departments all fail. Let's go to acupuncture. So therefore, we become very core treatment for them. Yeah. And, uh, and in fact, uh, and some of them, um, when they become so good, they want, they, want, they want to keep coming back and keep coming back. So now become, because of that very reason, we, they, our successful make our own trouble because too many people want to come back. So the waiting list is too long. And then some people can't get treatment and the result can't be good because too many people want to come. Do you want to expand the Asante Academy then? Well, Asante Academy is a... a I don't want to actually just expand just simply this academy. I want to expand this kind of model because I feel what I'm building of this service is, um, number one, is good model for, for, the, for, the, for Chinese medicine in this country because they serve the hospital well and then also can do the teaching and see the patient. And uh, of course, if I can expand Exante bigger, I would, but of course, I don't want to get too much administration work. I don't want to concentrate on my study, my research for my academic side. How has your experience changed as a consultant um, uh, working with the NHS from when you were lecturing in Oxford yeah, yeah. to the present day? Well, at least now, the even though it's very difficult to convince many doctors, medical professionals, but they, they still can be changed. So I have been luckily made a lot of friends in the hospital for many Western doctors, nurses, all sort of things, doctors, people. And they are from some of the people from the beginning, you know, know nothing about Chinese medicine, become a fan of Chinese medicine. Some of them become maybe negative about Chinese medicine, now become positive. So, so I think this is only beginning. So we need more people to work in this field because only we've got more doctors and more nurses and more medical, so, so, so medics so support us. And then we, that's what we can have hopefully a much better future. So uh, that's made me think, are the, the people that apply to the Asante Academy in practice mm -hmm. Chinese medicine are they themselves Chinese or no no our students we have a lot of students primarily from military university that's the number one student number two students we have are from many countries Europe we have a French doctors Greek doctors Italian doctors you know German doctors all when when they learn Chinese medicine in those in those country they don't have a practice they don't have a place to real practice to learn they probably have can go to a few seminars or maybe have a few books, but to put books to read, but they, there's no place to practice, which is a very important part. That's why they come here to train with us. So we have many, many people from continents, as well as many people from the UK, apart from our students. So therefore, that's another big part of our, our students too. As a teacher and researcher of Chinese medicine, um, what's What's sort of your typical practice as a researcher? What do you what do you what Well, I wouldn't say I'm a researcher. I'm a more clinician, to be honest with you. I see patients more. But even in the clinical work, it's also part of research anyway. So I, I don't want to say I'm a clinical sort of research doctor. So I'm a just normal doctor. So, but again, mm, yes, this is um, the work. And uh, uh, particularly, I feel the clinical side of research needs to be improved because that is where you can either convince or not convince people. You know, some people put a little laboratory research, oh, this medicine can make a little, little mouse better, or that medicine can make that little rabbit better. Okay, that's a little animal research something, or one little thing. But how can you really make human body better? So that's a very need to research. And particularly, some of the, some of the area is very difficult to repeat, some area it's like pain, for example, control the pain. It's very difficult to repeat your controlling because you either pain or pain. You can't just today is different from tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, what uh, areas are you particularly interested in within Chinese medicine? My area, perhaps more 
internal medicine, gynecological medicine. So this is probably my my area. So if if we want to work internal medicine, say for example, people suffer from high blood pressure, have a heart condition, have a cancer or diabetes, or does those things. Or gynecological area, for example, let's say women have a difficult conceived baby or have trouble with you know with with pregnancy or this thing. And uh, does that does your interest as a clinician um, does that influence uh, much of the teaching in the Asante Academy? Oh yes, um, yeah. because people come to here to learn or disinfect is what I want to do. People, they they want to get real knowledge in Chinese medicine. The 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 best part of Chinese medicine, or in fact the core of Chinese medicine, is clinics. If Chinese medicine not able treating illness. To people, you will not survive today. And uh, if if we are not able to treat some problem in the, in the Western country, like in England, we cannot be working here. The reason we can work here is because people can see they get better. Maybe some people say because placebo effect. Maybe some say you're lucky, just get better. But it doesn't matter whether you're lucky or placebo, we're getting better. So the masters and bachelor degree at yeah. Middlesex University. Do you try and instill it's more the experience of the patient and that interaction between the doctor and the patient? Yeah, this is, this is a, my, my philosophy is when people come to train to learn Chinese medicine, what I would simply say to them, at the end of the training, I want you to be able to see patients. Okay? I don't care how, how can you write your thesis, the best or not the best. What I want to see you is able to see patients. So that's, that's what I'm very practical man in this way. So that's why many, some other colleges, some of our school may be good for academic side or write, write some theory or books, everything. So for me, priority, the core of training is make sure after training, you're able to treat some illness. Uh, so, uh Larger scale bodies now are looking at um, the Association of Traditional Chinese Medicine and the British Society of yep. Chinese Medicine. Um, could you tell me your roles and responsibilities um, for those two bodies? In fact, all those organizations that I mentioned you to, I was the founder for them. So I initially helped them fund them to, to set up this, this whole organization. The reason I want to set up with other few colleagues together, I'm the key founder, is because I feel we need to work together. We need to have a, a sort of much better standard throughout all whole UK to practice. So that's why I found those organizations for the promoting Chinese medicine to improve the standard, improve the practice ethics, everything. So, and uh, now there are, um, there, there are, you know, expanding and the more people join so so at, at the moment i'm not actively working as a council member i'm just an advisor okay say for example for the atcm so and uh, but i do advise people but mainly it's that they work you know and uh, through through what we did in the past or carry on this same kind of regime so you're advising other professionals other pr other i advise say for example the uh, AT, to, as a ATCM, which is Association of Traditional Chinese Medicine, so I'm I'm honour ad, you know, ad, 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 ad advisor for them, and the advice sometimes ask me something, you know, but I'm not a council member now because I retired from there. Now, uh, when you were a council member, did you uh, who um, who were you uh, speaking to? Was it uh, members of the sort of Western practitioners? Or were you, um, how, how were you regulating or standardizing the quality of traditional Chinese medicine? Well, when I was a council member or when I was even chairman, I was trying to work um, with many other sort of a similar organization. Basically, I want to learn from them. For example, we learn from British nurse what standard they are, or British, let's say, in the osteopath organization, or British, some kind of sort of a a chiropractic organization, see how they control their professions. So we learn like the ethics, the practice, everything, or the standard of training or education. So we try. And uh, so, but of course, 
our medicine, in, in some way, is quite unique. It's different from what they're doing. So therefore, we have to think about the way we are suited for our practice as well control the quality. So that's why we give some advice. Say, for example, if you want to you know, set up a standard of acupuncture practice, what is standard? How many needles put in standard? Or how deep? These all things. So, of course, we, we, we advise them by one by one. What, what did you be standard? So, uh, how, how did you establish the standard? And well, what, what is, uh, is it uh, set down now? No, no, the standard is long. It's a very it's a big, it's big, big, it's big, bigger book. A big book. You can't go through all the things. Let's give some examples. So, for example, you know, what is the best way to put a needle in? So, are you putting a needle in, you know, and uh, uh, beforehand? Uh, should you wash your hand, not wash your hand, or wait where your hand you touch needle or no, no needle, and uh, and uh, and where should you put in? This in, in, in how deep, how how how, because in some area if you put deep like lung, you can penetrate lung, you can you can it's no good. So therefore, so it depends on all this this different area. So we have certain uh, certain sort of uh, rule. So if if people follow that rule or those standard, and the party will be safe. If you don't follow them, you may get in trouble. So it's a powerful way to protect the quality of care. Absolutely, of medicine. absolutely. And those those rule has to come from 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 people like me, professionals. Because if you ask the government or even ask the Western doctor to give you rule, they don't know how you practice. What what are you doing? You know, like cupping, is a cupping in the Western medicine don't do it. If you do it, so how you how, how what do you do the safest way? So we'll give them advice. How has uh, the ATCM grown? Oh, you know, ATCM, since I first started it, the first time I, I remember our general meeting, which is and also council meeting, is in my house because I host all the council members in my house. So 50 members. So now it's about nearly 800 members. So, so lots of members. So, you know, and because now I'm not a case, you know, ATCM council member, so I don't know how the day to day running. I'm just an advisor. 800 people would not fit in your house. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, so uh, what other uh, regulatory bodies uh, did, when you were the director, did yeah. you deal with? Yeah, in fact, I was also the member of a British government set up a wonderful regulatory body. It's called uh, the Department of Health. Many years ago, set up it's called Herbal Regulatory Working Group, which is set up a kind of legal frame of the legislation of, of herbal medicine, so we give a device as well. So that's running, commissioned by the, by by the Department of Health and uh, by the King's Foundation, you know, and in uh, uh, Prince Charles, sort of uh, foundation. So, and I was a member there for working for a couple of years, but of course at the moment this this is still a quite sort of a dodgy area. I said dodgy is it because of the government one day they said we want. To, Legislate another day. We say we we wait, and so that doesn't that's not really certain. Does legislation exist now that the ATCM helped produce? No, legally, legally at the moment, no formal legislation. So nothing, why either statutory uh, legislation or self-regulated regulation does nothing. So the government does why wants to do that, but they just change the mind all the time. And when did you found the ATCM? That is, a, I think it's a 1994. So is it a matter of frustration for you that in those years there is no legislation? Or? Oh, sure. I'm, God, I'm, I'm, I'm in some way, yeah, I was, even up to now, I'm frustrated too, because after so many years of working on this, try to promote, is we're still not able to properly legislate it, not properly protect our title, in, and also not properly protect the quality of Chinese medicine. So that's why still somebody, you know, like a cowboy practice, make it ruin our name. But if you have this legislated, perhaps less case like that. But, but I can t on, on on another hand, I can see, you know, the thing has moving ahead, but just wish slightly more faster and have a, you know, have something you know certain there. Going back to uh, th this idea of 
protecting Chinese traditional medicine um, and legislation, I think uh, what, what, what have been uh, the main turning points in, in, in that? You mean why we do that? Why we want to do that? Or? Not, uh, not why, but a actual um, uh, recognition or authority that you've gained. Uh, the well, I think the ATCM have gained. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, we haven't really gained any authority or any any recognition in informally, because, uh, in fact, I'm the one the pioneer to work in this field. For example, persuade university to study the course. This is one of the landmark. Put this way, and then I started on this hospital working at NHS, perhaps another landmark, because that's how we can say in this country, you know, Chinese medicine now is practicing at NHS. I can, I can give examples. I can tell people in this country, Chinese medicine has been educated in higher education, so I can do an example. That's, that's a landmark. But again, there's still only beginning, and uh, we still want more people to follow this footstep. And uh, there are some like teaching after Middlesex, there's a like East London University, South Bank University, Westminster University, even in the Manchester University, lots of universities follow the step, set of course, probably more than 10. But there's still small scale, so we need more to promote. What's the, uh, the best and worst parts of your job? Well, I think um, the best part is, as I said, I'm really happy when I'm working with patients, okay? I see patients get better, I help them, I see their smile, their appreciation. You know, many people even say to me, I had many patients tell me, when I, in the past, whenever I go back to China for holiday, they said, Dr. Kerr, please make sure you come back. You never not leave us here. We want you to come back. So they always afraid me to leave them, not come back to UK. I said, don't worry, I have to come back because my daughter's here. I can't run away. So I would want to come back. So this is a show that I very appreciate, you know, really really long. But on the other hand, of course, and um, the worst thing is that I'm still very frustrated in some ways from both in the public side, the in large, the Chinese medicine is still not really recognized, okay? Especially in medical profession or government. And also, and that, of course, we have to also talk about in our own profession, some of the doctors, some of the people, they're not doing their job properly, so ruin our name, so there's both. Uh, you mentioned you have a daughter, is she yeah. your only child? No, no, I have two daughters, in fact. I have two daughters, and they're both doing very well. In fact, my young daughter now, she's studying medicine. Uh, at the moment, she's in Cambridge to study medicine in year five. Then, then next year, will be qualified as a doctor. And uh, she sometimes comes here to Asante to study Chinese medicine. So I want training her both. So she got a Western, like, well, I study Western medicine too. When she got a Western medicine degree and law Chinese medicine. So perhaps that's the way going in the future for the next generation. So I have, I have fighting very hard battle to get recognition from Western doctor. But if my daughter comes, you don't need recognition because she's a Western doctor. What, what does your older daughter do? My older doctor also graduated from Cambridge. She studied philosophy. And uh, so, and then later on, she works, she studied another degree at Harvard and MBA. So now she works for the banks. So there's a business side. So given your years working with Western practitioners and now yeah. even your youngest yeah. is training to yeah. be a Western practitioner, yeah. has your view of Western medicine changed? Oh no, never changed. I still think Western medicine in many ways are very good, fantastic. The scientific sort of advance helped them a lot. So therefore, they have a good, good, not good technique, good, 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 good equipment, everything. But on the other hand, I see they are, in some ways, meeting going to the dead end because of the many illnesses they can't treat it. They can diagnose, but they can't treat it. So if somebody says, "Oh, you got epilepsy," what can I do? You got, you know, eczema. What can you do? Asthma. Okay, use inhaler. Use steroid cream. And that's not a solution. That's only reduce symptoms. So that's why we need to promote Chinese medicine to help the both. Find a problem and solve the problem. That might be the perfect note to finish on, but is there anything else that you'd like to... No, I think that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm trying to want to do. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Time. Gosh, <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Just, you know, this is a simple story to tell you to do. Oh, but simple. My, my goodness. You, uh, yeah, you gave us so much. You gave us so much. You gave us so much.